Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the session. I'm really excited about opening the meeting with a session that really gives us some pause to think about future directions in Earth system science. As you can tell, I am neither Peter Platzer nor Thomas Zerbukin. Um, both are delayed, so this morning you get me. My name's Paula Bontempi. I'm the Acting Deputy Director of the Earth Science Division at NASA Headquarters. And I am really pleased that you have such a great panel this morning to talk about future directions in Earth observations and Earth system science. And I think over the past couple of decades, in some sense, we've become a victim of our success. We have an incredible breadth of observations of the Earth, both in situ, suborbital, and remote. And we have a tremendous opportunity at the forefront of modeling, um, machine learning, AI, to actually utilize all those observations in a space for the good of the Earth, both exploration and societal benefit. So I'm really lucky to be standing up here introducing people with a real vision for where Earth system science is headed. So with that, I'm pleased to announce your first speaker, Martin Visbeck, who's going to talk to you about opportunities and in innovative Earth observation from space. Good morning, and uh, thank you, Paula, for the, the kind introduction. It's uh, my great pleasure uh, here to be opening the AGU 100 uh, with this session here on thinking about the future of uh, Earth observing and thinking about uh, what it means for Earth sciences, for Earth observing from space, combining it with situ data, as Paula said, also modeling, new opportunities from uh, AI and other technologies. But I want to start with a very simple picture like this. So this is a bit of Earth observing. Uh, take our planet, take the clouds away. These are the nights at light uh, that I'm putting together here from around the globe. And I always love to look at that picture. There's so many things you can discover just on that one image. You can see where people live that have so much energy that they can afford to keep the streets at light uh, at night. Uh, you can see other parts of the planet where there's not that many people. That means it's dark at night still. I suppose those can enjoy the beautiful starlights uh, then as a reverse benefit. But you also noticed, uh, I'm an oceanographer, that a lot of these lights happen in the coastal zone. And why is it that people like to live at the coast? So here's another image of piece of information that explains that. So this image shows you the world economy. 90% of the goods that we ship and use to be part of the world economy are, are, are shipped by merchant vessels. And this is an image that shows you the tracks of merchant vessels around the globe. And again, you can see uh, the abundance in the North Atlantic, in the North Pacific, and the Southern Hemisphere is much less trafficked, less economy there. And I think it makes a nice difference. Now, if you put these things together and just look where people actually live, this is this particular plot. And you see the difference on the night lights that, for example, when you go to Nepal or India, there's a lot more people living there who don't have that much energy to keep the lights on at night. It's an interesting difference between the two. But I think this graph sums it up. That is the graph of the population on our planet uh, from 1950 until today. And uh, in my lifetime, Paula, maybe in our lifetime, the world population has doubled. We are the first generation in Earth's history, human generation, that managed to double its number. We're probably also going to be the last generation that it happens, according at least to the forecast of where things are heading. And the numbers are by the end of the century will go from 7.5 billion where we are right now to about 10 or 11 billion going into the future. Now, in San Francisco, in DC, in Rome, in Kiel, where I'm from, that doubling didn't happen. That doubling happened in Asia. In our countries, we probably got 30% more in our lifetime, Paul. But the big numbers came from Asia. And if you look into the future, where the growth will happen, it's all going to be in Africa. So that's an interesting context for Earth observing, Earth science, Earth understanding. At the same time, we realize those 10 billion people have to make do with one planet. I know you guys from the space agencies, and we are looking for other planet-like uh, pl uh, systems uh, that maybe at some point people are going to move, and, but I don't think it's going to happen in the next 50 years. So I think for the next 50 years, we better think about how that's going to work with us. And science has told us, supported by a lot of space science, uh, that there are boundaries to our planet. It's a finite 
element. It's a finite system for water, food, energy, and some of these boundaries, like biodiversity, climate, are close to being crossed, to being compromising our ability to sustain uh, even 7 billion, let alone 10 billion people on our planet. If you look at that in the development context, uh, what do humans need in San Francisco and Kiel and in Kinshasa? They all want access to water, energy, income, education, resilience, gender equality, food, and so on. So more people, finite lifetime, means that safe and just operating space in the middle is going to get crowded. So space science, AGU science, environmental science has to think about what that just and safe operating space for humanity looks like. In the policy realm, our world leaders have noted that, and they developed the so-called 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, realizing that good life for all people on the planet has to be managed somewhere. There are 17 sustainable development goals in that particular circle here. And I'm going to speak about how space science, AGU science, planetary science will inform that. Now, as Paula said, we're in a wonderful time, in an era of lots of opportunity from space. This is the particular graph from ESA. I'm going to show you a NASA version later. And space science is really giving us so much information coming our way that really allows us to understand what is going on on the planet and gives us an understanding of the Earth system and hopefully informs us for the future. The same is true with the in system. I'm showing you here the ocean version of that, but the same is true for the cryosphere, for the land, also the social systems. More and more data coming our way. And I think if you combine space science, in situ science, and what I call big data, it becomes interesting. This particular one shows those same tracks of the shipping that I showed you before, but uses a Google AI algorithm to determine when ships are traveling, i.e. trading, and when ships are fishing. Whenever you see a light graph here, that's where people are fishing. A lot of fishing going on. Some protected areas you can see, there's not much fishing, but actually a lot of fishing happens illegally also in protected areas. So we can use space science, AI, to also police some of the illegal activity that we see on our planet. Wonderful partnership between an NGO, science, and Google. So what is the role of science? I'm a climate scientist, an ocean scientist, and I guess we are best known in the community that we're trying to understand the pressures that humans exert on the environment. We talk about climate change. We talk about biodiversity loss. We talk about pollution a lot. And you know what? A lot of our colleagues say, Martin, stop, stop. You're just about bad news. You're telling us how difficult it is. But actually, a lot of the science that we do from space and from the AGU is also thinking about resilience, disaster risk reduction, resilience for communities, resilient for the environment. We're using a lot of our standing to improve and to maybe restore uh, environmental system that can still deliver and will deliver in the future the environmental benefits that as humans we need. Last but not least, I'd say a lot of the science is really about prosperity. They're looking for space science, they're looking for AGU science, for environmental science, to really think about how humans and the environment can live together in a happy, sustainable way. Now, how do we do our science? I think it starts with discovery. And I will say, space has been wonderful. We've discovered so many things. And even if you send up space crafts to monitor our environment, for example, here's just one picture from a recent NASA JAXA mission, or two missions looking at the carbon cycle. Now, we think of forests being places where carbon gets drawn down. When we look at the data, we find that some of the rainforests actually emit CO2. That is a discovery. We didn't expect that. Is it because of the forest fires? Is it because of other things? We're always discovering new things when we fly our missions, when we go into the field. I think at universities, what we're trying to do, we're trying to make sense of the things that we discover. We want to promote understanding. And sometimes, if you get lucky, we have model systems, like here's an ocean system, where we can use our information and data to say something about even the future, make forecasts. I'm giving you one example of that understanding about forest fires, a big issue right now. And if you look at that and you compare the data from last year and this year, you can see how much more fires are in the Amazon right now. So it allows us to look in real time in what is happening in our Earth. We can also use the understanding and the data to put, in this time, GRACE data and ARGO data, that means space-borne and in-situ data together to understand what happens at our sea level and also attribute it. How much is from the warming of the ocean? 
how much is of mass advancement from melting glaciers, water coming into the ocean that wasn't there before. Very powerful science combining remote sensing and in situ. So I think as we go forward, we'll see more of that combined uh, uh, activity, remote sensing, in situ, modeling, all working together to get us to where we want to be. So we have the observation, the measurements, the models, assimilation, and the products that are informing our society and the science. Now for societies uh, and uh, politicians, they don't read our nature and science papers so much because they can't understand the technical language. So what's very critical are these assessments. Remember just in the last couple of weeks, we had an, an ocean cryosphere assessment from the IPCC. Earlier this year, we had the 1.5 degree assessment. IP Best came out, one on the biodiversity, and just two years ago, the one on ocean. So these assessments are critical. They're informed by our science. And I think space science has contributed a lot to these assessments because it allowed us to get global numbers. So we could produce graphs like this that I won't explain to you, but they're really rooted in space science, in situ science, to get the trends, the trajectories of what is going on on the planet right now. Very powerful, very hard to understand in detail, but very important to inform us for the future. However, that's all the pressures. So society is asking us, so where is the solution? What are we going to do in the face of biodiversity loss, climate change, sea level rise? And I like this particular publication that says Earth's observation can play a role in informing sustainable development. I think there's a huge potential for the next decade to do much more than we're doing right now. So I like that document. Let me just give you a glimpse of how these sustainable development goals pan out. So here you see the 17 goals on the top, and on the bottom you see two graphs. On the left, it's the OECD. It's the Japan's, the United States, the Europe's of the world. And on the right side, you see Africa. And that is just uh, an idea of the countries in these, two in these two regions of the world, how they are doing with the societal goals, more on the left side, meaning hunger, education, access to water, better in OECD countries than in Africa, and with the environmental goals, biodiversity, climate, ocean, better in Africa than where we are. So it's interesting to get that data, to put it in the policy context, to inform assessment of where we are in development and looking into the future. I think space science, earth science, environmental science will be very critical to allow us to, tr to track out these paths forward toward a more sustainable future. What are our options? What can space help us with that? Where do we want to go collectively? I think this is for AGU, for the next decade, an important uh, avenue to go down, supported by observations from space. New missions will help us to really evaluate these option tra trajectories, pathways, for development. Let me just give you one short example of what we're doing in the ocean. The United Nations just last year has proclaimed a decade of ocean science for sustainable development. You see, we're going beyond understanding the ocean. We want to use that understanding to inform development options. You see that in biodiversity. You see that in cryospheric science. It's a change of the kind of science we do. It's informing decision making, informing solutions. Now, the way I look at that is that what we really need is knowledge. On the top, you see global, regional, national governance. And those people in the governments, they want us to help them with decision support systems. They need to know where the people are. They need to know where the pollution is. They need to understand where the rainforests are and how they get perspective, where our options are for food. They want that decision support system. And honestly, we're not delivering it to them. If I look at the space, guys, you're doing better than others. You're serving up your data. But are we serving up all the knowledge together, the societal knowledge, the economic knowledge, the indigenous knowledge? No, we don't. In the space agency, we put the data from space-borne sensors there. But the communities want all the knowledge together in one hub, in one place. Unfortunately, for many development countries I work with, do you know where they get their information, their knowledge from, an environmental issue, an ocean issue? From Google. That's a disaster. We should be better than Google. We really should. So this is something that I'm telling the ocean guys, say, you know, work on that. Make, make, an, make an expert system, a cloud system, a hub system that has that ocean data together. In situ, remote sensing, societal data, solution data. That's a decision support system I think that our societies are clamoring for. Few summaries here. Innovation in space. We're going to hear about from the next talks. It's an enormously interesting uh, arena. 
a lot of innovation happening, a lot of economic opportunities there, technology, ideas, markets, many things, industry. We know that. It's going to be even more wonderful going forward. But I think partnership in space, what we should discuss in the next half hour more, with the environmental and earth science community here at AGU, with information products and delivery, I talked about that knowledge system, with, uh, and we're going to build on open data, open science, open access. We sure are doing much better now, and we should do even better in the next decade, because it's that type of information that allows scientists to do more discovery, more understanding, but also politicians to make smarter informed decisions. Finally, outreach in space, capacity building, visualization, Paula, you mentioned that. I really want to walk through in three dimensions with some sort of feelable Google uh, headset to a world in 2050 with climate mitigation without, with biodiversity loss without. We can do that. We can visualize the futures for our scientists, for our colleagues in society. Last slide, innovation in space, important, growth of the space ecosystem, partnership in space, really important. Information, products, and delivery are key, and outreach in space, visualization, and the virtual reality. But on the right, I put something down here. I told you, the growth in human society will be in Africa. What is Africa's strategy for space? What is our offer to Africa for space science? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mark. If there's a couple of questions to come up, is that okay? Worth All right. Something? Thank you so much, Martin. Um, that was definitely a talk that had me thinking about not only the exploration and discovery side of the research, but actually the critical need to feed all of the management and policy requirements back to the researchers when we do our planning. So thank you for that thoughtful assessment. Um, next up, um, I'm excited to hear from Yosef Ashbahar, who's going to talk to us about the ESA Earth Observation Program. Yosef. So thank you, Paula, for the introduction and really thank you, Martin, for such an inspiring talk, which is uh, quite amazing. It's, it's always a pleasure to listen to Martin. He's really a, a great uh, scientist, but also a great visionary of where we should go. And I'm very glad to say that he is also advising us uh, in uh, Earth Observation in ESA because he's the chairman of uh, the Advisory Committee on Earth Observation, which is a very important body uh, advising us on uh, some important aspects. So let me give you uh, some of the responses, I would almost say, to what uh, Martin was presenting. And I uh, swear we have not seen each other's presentation, but I'm glad to see that uh, what I'm presenting is not too far away from uh, what Martin was requesting us to do. It starts with this slide, which you have seen before. This is the ESA Earth Observation uh, capacity uh, as we have it today. Uh, you have uh, seen this slide uh, from Martin, but maybe also on other occasions. Uh, we are having three lines of satellites or satellite missions which we are developing. One is uh, the science missions, uh, the Copernicus missions, and the meteorological missions. I'm not going into all the details, but just to say that um, in ESA Earth Observation, we are doing this with different partners. On the left-hand side, the science missions, we call them Earth Explorers. We do with and for our member states and fully funded by our member states. The middle one, which is the Copernicus missions, we do with and for the European Union, uh, and the European Union being represented by the European Commission. This program is co-funded between the European Commission and ESA. And on the right-hand side uh, with uh, UMITSAT, uh, which is our meteorological, meteorological organization in Europe uh, dealing and operating uh, meteorological satellites. Again, uh, this is co-funded between ESA and UMITSAT. And uh, uh, the satellites, once uh, they are developed, they are handed over to UMITSAT for operation, and they would operate and disseminate the data. So it's a very a uh, rich and uh, full portfolio, 25 satellites uh, under development today and 15 in operation by ESA. But let me, before I go uh, into the next um, slides on how we respond to the challenges given by Martin, show you one slide, and I'm really very proud to show you this slide, which is the result of uh, last week's ministerial conference uh, where we have been putting our next uh, funding uh, slides uh, together to our member states. Uh, for those of you who know, ESA is funded uh, uh, periodically. We call it ministerial conferences about every three years. 
uh, and uh, we are proposing uh, to our member states some programs. They can or cannot put money into these programs. Some, uh, some of the uh, projects are being fully funded, some are uh, funded at 80%, some at 50%, and some of them even above what we ask for. And this happened to us. I have to say we are pretty lucky because our ministers collectively saw that Earth observation is a top priority for them, and they have given us more money than we asked for. Can you imagine that? And uh, we have got uh, altogether about 200 million more. If you see the, the middle column here, 2.6 billion, uh, which we got, and we have been asking them to give us money for 2.394 billion, or 2.394 million, uh, which is uh, uh, a small amount. It's about 9% uh, less than what we at the end obtained. And this is really incredible. It's the first time in the history of ESA that we get so much more money than we ask for. And there's one that sticks out in particular, which is the second line, which is Copernicus, where we got 29% more than, uh, than what we proposed. 29% more, which is uh, quite remarkable. And the reason is that uh, our ministers recognize that Copernicus, but Earth observation in general, is addressing the needs which uh, Martin was uh, putting there. And it really is a huge success for Earth observation at the ministerial. We have, been, uh, we have become the largest uh, uh, program in ESA, uh, and we have got an increase. I, I'm almost uh, ashamed to say that, or uh, we've got an increase between 2016, the last ministerial, and this one of 89%, uh, which is quite, uh, quite significant. But going into the substance of it, this is what we proposed, and this is what uh, we got funded, about 11 different satellites of different sizes and different uh, natures. Uh, six of them are Copernicus satellites, uh, but also Earth Explorer, uh, then smaller satellites uh, which cover the new space uh, domain. Uh, you see on the bottom left, uh, Scouts and FISATs, which are uh, from very small to medium-small satellites uh, to really uh, see how we can also stimulate that market, and uh, some preparation of other missions in the future. I'm not going through the list one by one, but just to say that we have a very rich portfolio which we proposed and where we got uh, the money from, from our member states. You have seen these uh, symbols uh, from Martin. They are the same ones to really see how we can address the global challenges. Um, they are expressed uh, to, through the Paris Agreement, the SDGs, uh, the Disaster Risk Reduction, uh, the Sendai Agreement, but there are also some others that are related to it, but these are the key ones that are addressing uh, these uh, challenges. So how do we do this in our ESA context? One element uh, which we uh, have been proposing is called Future EO, which is our envelope program, uh, which is really an envelope that goes from technology development, science, uh, architectural studies, all the way to building a satellite, uh, operating the satellite, and then exploiting the satellite for the benefit of society, which is more on the right-hand side. And you see on the right-hand side, there's one box called Grand Science Challenges, and this is a, a new domain where we build on our relation we already have with the European Commission, but to really see what are these challenges and how we can address them with our space data. You also see somewhere in the middle here, EO Africa, and I'm happy to say that this EO Africa element is a response to discussions which we had with Martin uh, through the context of our advisory committee on Earth observation, and this re really is one concrete action where we put money uh, on the table in order to see how Earth observation can help uh, Africa and the people in Africa as very uh, well uh, outlined before. So the, what we see here is uh, exactly what Martin was portraying before, that uh, you can not only live on uh, satellite observations, but what you do need is a full spectrum of uh, measurements from other devices, in situ measurements, models, the ICT uh, domain, cloud computing, artificial intelligence, all of it fitting together in order to really work on these societal challenges. And this is exactly the approach which we are taking. Uh, we are building up a partnership with uh, the European Commission's uh, RTD uh, Directorate General, which is uh, the one in charge of Horizon Europe, which is the big funding uh, slide uh, about 100 billion uh, euros uh, in the next uh, seven years, 21 to 27, and we're building up a partnership to see how their funding can be matched with ours in order to make sure that our little space money can really have an impact also on the larger societal questions which they are addressing. And we're doing this, and this is one concept which we developed more recently, and Martin may not yet know this uh, part of it, which is that we are building up something called Digital Twin Earth. It may sound grand, it may sound bold, but that is exactly 
going into the same direction that we do combine Earth observation with models, with artificial intelligence, to make sure that we understand various elements of our planet. We are able to simulate them, and therefore we are able to predict some of the elements, but certainly better understand the science and the various interactions of these, uh, of these uh, individual parameters. And I think the highlight really is here, uh, as also said by Martin before, is on predictions and simulations, that you want to know what happens if the Amazon forest is burning, what happens is if the sea level is rising, which cities are underwater, and what are the impacts to people living there. And this is exactly the questions we want to build up more systematically and more homogeneously through our activities, which we are building up as part of our new vision. And one element which I I think is missing, at least in Europe, uh, in our part uh, today, is that we need to reinforce our computing capabilities, our simulation capabilities. Uh, they are existing. We have fantastic centers across Europe uh, which is doing that, but also across the world. But they need to be connected, and the various uh, uh, elements from observations uh, to, to modeling uh, to artificial intelligence, these elements need to be, be better connected in order to really do some of the simulations uh, which are necessary in order to do that. And therefore, I was recently uh, in contact with some of our colleagues uh, in the European Commission who are in charge of what they call Digital Europe, which is uh, building the digital infrastructure of Europe. And uh, we, are, uh, we are developing some concepts at this stage, but at some point this will hopefully result in concrete projects on how we better align our activities on Earth observation and some of these ICT capabilities that are necessary in order to do exactly that. And to exactly do what uh, Martin was saying before, that we don't need to go to Google, to Google in order to find out which areas are underwater, but to really have a much better simulation of how this can be done and really predict uh, what the life of those people is and how this life will be uh, implicated. Uh, and there, I'm really investing, or we are investigating how to invest and what to do in order to really build up this digital uh, twin Earth uh, model with computing capabilities uh, across, uh, across Europe. So we have established, uh, or we, we are establishing this partnership with the European Commission, uh, which is uh, outlined here through a, a certain mechanism, a joint planning working group, common scientific agendas, and flagship actions. And what I'm showing you now is some of these examples of these flagship actions which we're identifying in order to uh, really address uh, some of these questions. You see here uh, some uh, symbols which are going from climate science to polar science to health, uh, freshwater, addressing different topics. And I'm showing some examples of uh, how we do uh, some of these boxes and what, how uh, the Earth observation uh, data are combined with uh, models, with simulations in order to have a better understanding of our planet. You know this graph, I don't need to explain it, uh, sea level rise, which is quite uh, significant. You also know the publication of the National Academy of Sciences, which uh, predicts an increase of uh, uh, sea level to about 1.3 meters by the end of the decade, uh, which is drastic. But this doesn't help us. It's an important information, but it doesn't solve our problem. What we really want to understand is how does this impact people? And this is exactly what was said before also by Martin in his speech. And in order to do that, you need much more information. You need, uh, of course, the observations on one side, but a much better understanding, simulation of the whole system, uh, which we're doing right here. This is a statement from the World Climate Research Program on Sea Level Grand Challenges, uh, which is exactly what we're aiming at doing. And this, of course, is what people want to see. What they want to know is, is my area on the coastline affected by it? Uh, is my house swept away or is my hut swept away? And this is uh, exactly what needs to, to be understood and better uh, presented. Another example is uh, polar regions. You see here polar science as one of these flagships uh, we are addressing. Again, you see, uh, for, based on observations, uh, the changes of uh, the ice masses. Uh, quite impressive, uh, of course, over the Arctic and Antarctic, you don't have many other measurements. You have to rely on satellites to a large extent, but also not only satellites, you have to combine this again with models and with uh, different information. One of these is what we call Cryosat Cryotop Calving Fronts, uh, which is a project we have initiated recently, and this is a, a new result that just uh, was published uh, by Enveo, a company uh, in Austria doing ice research, and they have been uh, simulate, they have been measuring and then uh, displaying graphically these calving fronts. Uh, what you see here is about 800 kilometers of width, uh, which is uh, uh, shown here, uh, and how they change uh, over, over time. And this is the type of information which you want to see. 
Another example is, again, the Antarctic, but in this case, underground. Uh, there's a thick ice mass on, on the poles, up to about four kilometers. But what you also need to understand is how does the Earth look underneath in order to better understand some of the dynamics that happen on the surface, uh, which is quite, uh, quite important. Uh, this is work done by the University of, of Kiel with Bass and the University of Delft, and uh, based again on measurements of our Gauche satellite and obviously a better understanding of uh, the whole uh, dynamics uh, uh, under, uh, in the Earth crust and how this is uh, working uh, together. Again, uh, one element of this digital twin Earth uh, simulation, uh, which we're doing here. Another example, acidification, uh, was also mentioned. Uh, again, a mix of uh, observations from our satellites and uh, modeling aspects. Uh, what you see here is dissolved uh, inorganic carbon. You see that uh, there is some plumes coming out from the uh, Amazon area, uh, Amazon uh, uh, River uh, Basin. Uh, and of course, you need this information and their dynamics to better understand how they interact and what their impacts are uh, for marine protected areas, for coral reefs, uh, for Amazon mouth uh, reef uh, uh, measurements, uh, which is uh, some of the information that is uh, essential. Another example, uh, again, here on coral reefs is, uh, is shown on this map. Uh, and again, a combination of uh, the uh, information from satellites, as you measure them here, this is Sentinel-2. Uh, you have two dates here, one in June 2016, one in February 2017, and you see the bleaching of these coral reefs very clearly uh, based on the uh, information that is provided, which is one input uh, to uh, the wider simulation of, um, uh, of the system. One nice example is shown here on extremes, and this is the, the water cycle in the Mediterranean base. And here we have launched a, a project recently, um, and I have to say this is quite a nice example because it does really take into account the various elements of the water cycle and how they interact. And the Mediterranean is not an easy one to study uh, because, as you see here, uh, it has different uh, uh, ba river basins, uh, uh, including mountains from the Alps, but also from the northern African areas, uh, where you, you have very different conditions and different situations on uh, how uh, precipitation, evapotranspiration uh, is behaving, groundwater is being stored, and these are uh, measurements, or these are a combination of measurements and simulations which are done here on, on this example. This is one of the projects where we actually, which we would like to use as one of the cases, uh, what uh, we would call the digital twin earth uh, uh, modeling, uh, where we have uh, uh, certain domains and certain areas. Of course, you can refine them, you can work on certain parameters, but I think what is important is really to, to measure them and see the complexity and the interconnection of those parameters and see how they interact. And if you change one parameter, what is the consequence of another one? You can easily imagine what what will change if the albedo is changing in terms of evapotranspiration, uh, of precipitation, of uh, river runoff, runoffs, of groundwater storage, and, and so on. And these are obviously interconnected uh, key parameters. And what uh, we want to end up with is, uh, what is coming in a, in a second here, is really a, a better modeling of this area, uh, which will be showing the various parameters over time, uh, and hopefully also allowing us to to simulate, if you tune one parameter, how this influences another one, uh, which is uh, uh, shown here in these graphs, uh, which are showing some of the, um, uh, these measurements, uh, but also their interconnectivity and how they relate to each other. And I think this is a, a good example of uh, where, we, where we are heading and how these uh, interactions are, are working. Another example is uh, the flagship on geohazards. Uh, again, um, we are living in Europe in a in a hazardous area, uh, we have floods, we have uh, earthquakes, we have volcanic eruptions, uh, we have uh, storms, uh, just uh, like in many other parts of the world. Again, satellites provide one piece of information, not the only one, uh, but again, in combination with other uh, in-situ information with a, a more synthetic uh, approach of the Earth system, uh, this again helps us in building up what we call a 4D Earth uh, which is uh, a combination of the various aspects of uh, observations with uh, modeling. Another example is terrestrial carbon. Uh, you see here the carbon cycle, and uh, there are two satellites that are upcoming on our side called Flex and, and, Carb and Biomass, which are both measuring different parameters of vegetation. Flex um, measuring fluorescence uh, estimates, uh, which uh, allows you to 
detect stress in plants uh, way earlier before you see them visually with uh, a browning of the leaves or in a color in the or in the, in the signal in the, in the infrared. Uh, and this is uh, quite an interesting, exciting mission. Will be launched in a, in a few years and will provide a, a very new insight in the vegetation uh, dynamics of our of our planet. And biomass uh, similarly, uh, which is a P band SAR. Air, um, uh, events are a mission. Here you see some simulations based on airborne data. Again, uh, very useful additional information which we are getting here. Another example, uh, water and food systems. Uh, food, we have just uh, heard about Africa before. Again, this is one response of how our satellites can be used to better simulate uh, some of these uh, elements uh, here. Uh, this particularly addressing uh, food uh, systems and freshwater as key parameters uh, of our ecosystem. So how we group this is in what we call in science clusters. Uh, we have uh, here four of them which are uh, underlined or which are being developed. Um, I think the important aspect is really bringing all the various elements together as uh, just mentioned before. But also, and this is quite important, I do have a, a more organized uh, interaction with the, with the community, both in Europe but also internationally. And this will be for us extremely important to work uh, with various partners in the US, in Japan, uh, in China, in other parts of the world to make sure that we have a, a better organized way of how these uh, topics are being addressed and how they can uh, better be, uh, how we can better interact with the international community. And talking of which, and this is my uh, last slide, which is uh, really showing the importance of international cooperation. Uh, we have a group called the uh, Joint uh, Program Planning Group with NASA, uh, which is quite exemplary of how we work together internationally. It's, uh, it has been established in 2010. We are meeting annually, at least, uh, sometimes more often. And it's a very well-organized uh, group of, uh, with working groups, uh, with uh, schedule, with, uh, pro with uh, actions, uh, with uh, uh, deadlines on, on the actions, and really a clear vision of where we go. And the main goal is to make sure that, at least in this case, the European and the American, or the NASA and the ESA uh, activities are well harmonized, are well working together towards some of these common goals which we're expressing. And I really would like to express my my thanks and my sincere appreciation to NASA, in particular for the excellent cooperation which we have and we have built up uh, over the years. Uh, and this is a very strong partnership uh, which I would like to continue. And one example uh, you see here, uh, which is, um, is quite a nice one, is IMBI, uh, which is uh, the mass balance uh, uh, activity we have uh, initiated some years ago between ESA and NASA, where we have uh, brought uh, scientists and uh, uh, groups together working on, on mass balances and uh, these uh, scientists are a bit stimulated and a bit helped by both ESA and NASA but uh, working on their own have really published tremendous uh, results uh, recently on the, on the uh, Antarctic uh, ice melting and the changes of the mass balance and what it does mean for our global uh, ecosystem. And I have to say this was such a nice work that uh, we are thinking of uh, continuing this type of cooperation in other domains and I would like to to keep the tension high uh, because uh, Sandra and myself will make uh, an announcement after her speech or at the end of her speech uh, in order uh, to see how we can proceed in other topics on, on, on this domain. <clears throat> other uh, um, domains are more on the hardware side uh, where we are also working together is uh, for example on uh, gravity uh, missions. Um, at the moment we have Grace uh, follow on flying. Uh, we're already thinking of what needs to be done afterwards. Uh, we call it NGGM on the European side, uh, mass uh, change on the US side, uh, to see how we can work together and really have a combined system that allows to look at the mass change or gravity uh, after uh, Grace follow on. And this is something I'm also looking forward on top of some other mission cooperations which we have in mind and we are discussing at our level. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yosef. Um, as if Martin's call to action, you know, didn't sink in, what I loved is that it's very clear that ESA and their successes um, really is rising to that call, and I really appreciate that, and congratulations on the success at the ministerial as well. Um, in keeping with that light of innovation, I'd like to introduce Ms. Sandra Kaufman, who's going to speak with you about uh, NASA's Earth uh, Science Research. Sandra?
to fit it in. Well, good morning. And uh, no, we did not coordinate. Uh, however, that you're going to uh, hear the similar, the, you know, trends and the topics that, that, that we are uh, going to be discussing. Um, however, I do want to start with, uh, let me see what this is, 50 years ago. So 50 years ago, uh, we could barely see what we were seeing. Uh, so the image on the top was taken on February 13th. Uh, 1965, after Tyrus uh, 9th was launched. And um, uh, what they did was paste together 450 images to get a global view uh, of, of the Earth. And uh, the image on the bottom was taken exactly 50 years later, on uh, February 13th, 2015. And um, as, as you can see, uh, you know, 50 years later, we not only you know, can observe the Earth in its full um, color, but uh, we uh, um, are able to do these global composites on, on a daily basis, hourly basis, in multiple parameters, multiple you know, uh, scales. Uh, so uh, you know, we have come a long ways uh, since uh, the beginning of uh, you know, Earth observations. So, uh, so we continue uh, observing Earth and um, uh, we need to uh, continue uh, characterizing it, understanding it, Im improve the measurements, uh, and, and that's uh, what, what we are all about. That's what you heard from uh, Martin, that's what you heard uh, uh, from Joseph. Uh, and um, it is, uh, you know, the ability to, to understand it as a system, to understand all of these things from all the scales, from all uh, uh, ways of looking at the interactions between the processes and everything. Um, it is uh, all of you uh, in this room and, uh, you know, all the, the, the countries that are able to, you know, collect these images, the, the, you know, the collaboration that enables us to really understand Earth as a system and be able to, um, uh, you know, study and, and, and put all the pieces together. You know, we uh, have come a long ways in 50 years, but we still have a, a long ways to go. Uh, so from the NASA side, you uh, kind of saw this one in Martin's uh, uh, slide, uh, but we, we have a rich um, um, program in our science of um, satellites. Um, the images, on, uh, the missions on the left going all the way to the right are missions in formulation all the way to missions uh, in, in implementation, uh, missions in um, the um, prime operations and extended operations. Uh, we also have been uh, using the um, space station as a platform, and uh, we also have been uh, doing have a rich program in CubeSats uh, that not only are being used for the technology uh, demonstration, but also uh, uh, we've been obtaining a significant uh, scientific value from from these um, CubeSats. But we couldn't do any of it without uh, the collaboration that we have well, with um, uh, multiple um, countries. Uh, and multiple partners that we have. And um, as, as you can see, uh, the, the, the international collaborations are, are the, uh, multiple and, and very rich. And um, we also have interagency cooperations uh, here in the United States uh, with uh, USGS, uh, with our Landsat uh, program. And uh, we are the, right now uh, studying the uh, architectures uh, for the next generation Landsat, uh, uh, hopefully, uh, uh, with a launch uh, around the 2027 uh, time frame. Um, but we also use uh, airborne platforms, uh, and they constitute a very important part of the uh, Earth Science uh, program. Um, they they, they complement and contribute to all of the satellite observations. Uh, so it is not just what we can do um, from space, but uh, also the collaborations and the, and the a uh, variety of um, uh, airborne uh, science programs, that, the missions and, and uh, campaigns that we have. And um, all of the observing systems that we have been um, um, developing, instituting, uh, working with, you know, using the space station, uh, we have the virtual uh, GPM a constellation, again, a, a very rich collaboration without which we couldn't understand uh, um, uh, global precipitation. 
Uh, we have uh, the A train and now the C train with Calypso and CloudSat on a lower orbit. Uh, we have been using uh, small uh, satellite constellations, um, looking into hosted payloads, different ways in which we can obtain data. Uh, I already mentioned CubeSats, but another aspect of CubeSats is the um, a small satellite constellations of um, companies um, um, produce data out there. Um, many, many companies are now uh, in the business of producing earth science data, and um, uh, we will be missing a big opportunity if we don't look at what they have to uh, provide and, uh, and, and, and offer and uh, how uh, they can augment um, all of the uh, other aspects that we do. So uh, with that, you know, we collect a, a, a large number of uh, observations uh, data. You know, you talk about the, um, the sea surface temperature, land temperature, vegetation, aerosols. I mean, uh, and I, can, I have two pages of uh, uh, things that we, data that we collect. You know, so when we talk about uh, uh, data gaps, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of hard to figure out where the gaps are because we are collecting so much information in a variety of ways like sea level rise and, and um, uh, Joseph and, and Martin uh, talked about this, uh, but you know, combining uh, uh, data sets and modeling give us the, uh, data such as this. Uh, we couldn't do it without you know, just uh, one satellite or, 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 the, um, or just one model. We need to continue collecting all of this data uh, for the trends, for the past, for the future. Um, I already spoke about the, uh, the global precipitation uh, constellation, but without uh, all of the uh, 10 uh, satellites that are contributing to the global precipitation, we could not really get a global view of uh, uh, the global precipitation uh, with partners like uh, ESA and UMEDSAT and NOAA uh, and CNES and ISRO. Uh, so the reason we are able to observe the global precipitation is because of, of this data and the collaboration and all of the modeling that we are able uh, to do. And um, talking about the airborne, you know, the campaigns, the large number of campaigns that we have, this is a, a uh, a crazy slide of all of the campaigns that we've have had since 2005 and 2017, uh, but they allow us to get uh, more comprehensive data uh, sets of observations. Uh, they give us the ability to function as a virtual satellite to target remote sensing observations uh, as, as needed and as desired. Uh, they provide calibration and validation for our, our satellites and opportunities to engage with the students and early uh, career researchers. Uh, and they uh, also provide a, a large number of opportunities to engage uh, with our partners um, out there. And of course, uh, uh, from the application's point of view, you know, in an emergency, we can just, uh, you know, do a campaign and be able to collect data for application purposes. So this is a little more uh, flexible than uh, launching satellites. So, you know, it is uh, this is scaling um, strategy uh, view that allows us to uh, look all the way from a leaf to uh, the, the, the satellite uh, vantage, vantage point of a space uh, and be able to put all this together and analyze it and understand it and, 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 and that gives us a good view of, of what um, uh, the earth is doing and the, how the earth is changing and uh, understand uh, all the processes and, and procedures that are, that are uh, happening. But the, the, the important thing in many ways is, you know, how do you make good use of all of that information for the benefit, the societal benefit of, of uh, the, the, the people in this planet? Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the, the richness of all the data has to be used for uh, that benefit. Uh, we have a, a, a program doing uh, health and air quality water resources, ecosystems, food security, across the, the entire world. Uh, we have a rich um, um, a disasters program, uh, training for the utilization of, of our data. They develop, uh, uh, it is a, a great program uh, in many countries around the world. Uh, they severed in, in, um, in cooperation with USAID uh, across the world. And then we have uh, all other kinds of ad hoc activities uh, in the applied uh, sciences, uh, 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 realm, uh, but they allow us to, to discover 
all kinds of innovative and practical uses of, of earth science data. And uh, we need to continue investing the time to um, um, apply this data in, in, in many different ways. Uh, I really love the uh, digital earth uh, thing you have. That's great. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, along those lines, you know, we've been uh, helping fisheries avoid endangered Atlantic sturgeon. Uh, so uh, this is uh, in the Delaware uh, Bay. And uh, it's a, a lot of um, um, information that we have been giving them uh, to try to provide uh, uh, the level of, of risk that they, uh, they have uh, um, with the aqua aquatic ta tagging observations that we can do. Um, we, uh, in the uh, applied sciences also, uh, the recovery after post-fire, um, uh, we have had a lot of fires uh, here in California and uh, we have been uh, not only uh, responding to the disasters in, in helping the firefighters, but also after uh, uh, the fire, uh, uh, the, the post-fire decision support uh, for the boots on the ground. Uh, of course, improving air quality uh, maps uh, across the world. Uh, I uh, most recently, uh, you probably have uh, read the, the news about New Delhi and, and all of the um, uh, air pollution in there. Uh, and it is a big issue, you know, that, that we uh, need to really uh, monitor, track, and, and, and figure a way to, to help uh, with, the, uh, with, with the data that we have. And, and I totally agree, you know, Google is not a good uh, uh, way to, to, to find all of this out. We have the data, we have the information. So how can we take all this information and put it in the hands of the, the people, the policy makers, the decision makers in the a uh, variety of, uh, um, you know, um, counties, towns, uh, uh, other countries, uh, so they can understand and, and make decisions that are, uh, are helping their communities. And um, the, the other one is malaria. Uh, you know, it kills uh, three million people uh, every, every year. And, uh, you know, I get on a plane to go someplace uh, in Timbuktu and I have to take malaria pills, you know, because it is a, a, a big issue, you know. So how can we uh, uh, help um, predict uh, incidences of malaria? And uh, we are on it. We're trying to, uh, you know, help uh, uh, those aspects as well. So um, um, the Decadal, uh, 2017 Earth Science Decadal, um, you know, gave us a, a, a big challenge. Uh, you know, we have to uh, thrive in a changing planet. That's, uh, you know, basically the, 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 the tension that there is, you know, the planet keeps changing, things keep moving. It's a very dynamic planet. So how can we uh, observe it, model it, and, and, and understand it in a manner that, that we can not only understand what is happening right now, but in a manner that we can predict what it will happen uh, in, in the future? So um, the way um, um, I personally um, uh, see it, uh, and, and, and you saw the same uh, uh, type uh, of, of uh, uh, trends in, in Joseph's and, and Martin's slides, is all the big data. And uh, you know, we are the victims of our own success. We have a large amount of data, volumes and gobs and gobs of data. Uh, we, in, just in NASA, we are the, uh, with the launch of uh, uh, SWAT and NISR, we are, the, um, um, in, in, you know, we have about 30 petabytes of uh, volume data right now in the EOS, uh, this archive, and uh, it's going to increase to approximately 250 petabytes by 2025. You know, that's uh, just a large amount of data, and, and it, this is just NASA. You know, when you add everything else, it's just, uh, uh, you know, mind-boggling the amount of information and data. Uh, that is out there. We have a multi-platform, multi-instrument, multi-program. You know, it is a, a multi-science data fusion that, that, that we need to really uh, work together to um, understand, analyze, uh, and, and be able to, to model how things are, are going to look uh, in the future. And so uh, uh, not only we need efficient way to store uh, this data, but we also need a, a, a way to be able to, to analyze it and uh, and uh, we have been, uh, you know, trying to look at a new paradigm on how to uh, do all of these uh, in, in, in this uh, artificial intelligence, uh, big data, you know, computing um, power that, uh, that, that we have. And, uh, you know, so the cloud 
offers uh, performance and cost benefits and that we are the, um, uh, doing pilots uh, um, to see if, if that's going to uh, be able to work for us. Um, of course, you know, you can buy gobs and gobs of servers and, uh, and try to, to do it uh, that way. But, uh, you know, so you have to do the cost benefit analysis of what industry is uh, uh, proposing and providing uh, versus what we can uh, buy and do ourselves, you know. So there is a little bit of a, a trade that you have to do there. Uh, you know, we have to improve the cross archive center collaboration. We have to enable the users to look at all of this data in one place and not have to download a little bit here, a little bit there, and, uh, and analyze things. Uh, you know, so, and we need to continue supporting uh, open science with open source software with, uh, you know, uh, free and, and open uh, data. Uh, and, uh, and that's a challenge when uh, you uh, throw in the mix uh, the data by buying data from the commercial sector because they are also trying to uh, uh, provide a service and uh, how can you uh, take that information and you don't want to offer it for free, you know, so there are some uh, uh, limits as to how much we can uh, pay and how much we can do with the data that we purchase uh, uh, from commercial outfits. So, um, just to end, uh, so, we need, we're continuing to, to meet the challenges of the 21st century, and, um, uh, but we have so much more work uh, to do. So, um, we, we, from the scientific point of view, we need to continue pushing the emerging boundaries in basic, basic research and engin engineering and all this interdisciplinary science and be able to, to combine all of these uh, data sets in order, in order to provide the, 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 the benefit, uh, the societal benefit that. Uh, that, that we need to uh, and, and we must do. Uh, we need to work with um, uh, national and regional leaderships in the applied research uh, areas and understand uh, what is it that they need. We are in the decadal planning as we move into the future, uh, not looking at applied sciences as the, the, the end game, uh, but we are putting it at the forefront. We are working with the stakeholders and communities at the very beginning to try to understand how the missions, the observing systems that we are implementing can be better done in order to serve them better in the end. Um, partnerships continue to leverage all of the uh, fantastic partnerships that we have uh, with uh, many uh, countries out there. Uh, and, and I do um, agree uh, tremendously with, with Joseph. We have a, a great partnership uh, and uh, we have a, a big opportunity uh, to continue to partner. Things are aligning really uh, well uh, with our decadal and uh, ESAS programs and um, uh, we, are the, we have a, a lot of opportunity to, to work together there. Of course, um, uh, policy, expanding the boundaries between the science and action. You know, we don't make policy but we do influence uh, the policymakers, and we also, uh, with our data, can understand uh, the impacts of those policy decisions. And, and I have to say, you know, diversity, uh, it is a challenge. It continues to be a challenge. Uh, we need to make sure that we continue to have a diverse uh, uh, workforce. Uh, only that, that way we can continue to uh, innovate and, and be creative and, and competitive in, in, in the world um, um, environment. Um, and, um, you know, we need to diversify ourselves. We need to diversify our, our constituency and continue to champion in uh, STEM education. And, and all of you out here, please do go to schools, talk to uh, colleges, talk to uh, uh, you know, people out there, you know, you have the knowledge, you have the understanding, go and, 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 and teach, you know, be uh, uh, stewards uh, uh, and, um, you know, a mentors to some of these uh, up and coming uh, scientists and engineers. But more than that is uh, educating uh, people out there on what we do and why Google is not a good idea. You know, why uh, using uh, uh, earth science uh, data that we uh, together uh, uh, have and, and provide is, is, is a better proposition. And, uh, and the last thing is, uh, you know, um, the communication. Yeah, I already said that, you know, communicating uh, with the public. Uh, so um, it, is, uh, it is very important. So um, uh, I want to ask Joseph to come up. Uh, and uh, Joseph talked to uh, us about the INBI. Uh, it is the ice sheet mass balance with the comparison exercise. Uh, that was a very successful um, 
um, exercise that we did together, uh, ESA and NASA. Uh, it combined 26 independent satellite data sets from 14 different um, NASA and ESA uh, satellites to track global warming effects uh, on Greenland. Uh, the, the really good news, and actually uh, an announcement is going to be made um, uh, shortly, the findings uh, confirm uh, previous worst case projections uh, for sea level rise. Uh, so um, uh, this is a very uh, incredible international collaboration that uh, involved between 86 scientists from 50 different institutions. Uh, you know, so INBI uh, was a big deal between uh, ESA and, and NASA. And uh, we are happy to announce that we are going to do another of these exercises. And uh, Joseph? Um, so um, uh, we call it the Arctic Methane uh, Challenge. Uh, and uh, we're planning another joint um, um, initiative to investigate the linkages between uh, permafrost degradation and Arctic methane emissions. Uh, so we are looking forward to working with ESA in, uh, in this new uh, exercise. And I don't know if you wanted to. Uh, uh Maybe just one word to add. So first of all, thank you, uh, Sandra, for pulling up this slide. So this really is um, um, building on the success we had uh, with IMBI. That means the science communities on both sides of, uh, of the Atlantic uh, publishing enormously important results uh, for the community. So we have been reflecting for quite some time uh, together with NASA and ourselves of what could be other candidates uh, where we think there's a, a problem to be solved, where there is measurements from space that are important contributions to the solving and better understanding the system. And we had a long list actually of some 12, 15 uh, different topics. And at the end we decided for methane, uh, methane from permafrost, but not only permafrost, as you see the title says Arctic methane emissions, because there's also some uh, emissions actually coming from the oceans, uh, which might sound interesting, but uh, this is really an important topic. So what we want to do together is uh, both ESA and NASA uh, to stimulate the community. We're looking for champions on each side of the Atlantic who are building up uh, research and science teams and work on this, uh, on this topic. What uh, ESA and NASA can do and will do is support the process uh, with, uh, I would say, little money. It's not huge amounts of money which we are uh, allocating, but really to stimulate the community and make sure that uh, some further and important research is done on this topic because we think that this is one of the burning issues of the next uh, years, if not decades, uh, to come. Thank you so much. And, um, uh, let me and uh, we have uh, um, some flyers out there on, uh, if you want to pick one, actually they're on the chair there. We'll pass them out. out. <laughs> yeah, there are some flyers uh, both here on the chair, so please come forward. Mm -hmm. uh, there is points of contact mentioned. Uh, it's uh, Diego uh, Fernandez on the ESA side and uh, Chip Miller on the NASA side, but they, end, they serve as primary points of contact, but we look for champions. Uh, for, who are then uh, leading the science communities and bringing them together. So they will not be the ones uh, which are then uh, stimulating this community, but for the time being, the, the ESA and NASA points of contact serve as entry point, uh, and then we would like to organize a major uh, workshop uh, in the in beginning of next year where we bring the people together, and then uh, I would say the leadership should come out of the community itself. Thank you, Joseph. So that's it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, um, Sandra and Yosef, for that announcement. And also, um, thank you to Sandra for raising maybe something unique and different about um, Earth system science opportunities, which is bringing up the point of STEM and diversity in, in our planning, which should be integrated into our science, technology, and engineering. So our last speaker of the session is uh, Terayuki Nakajima, who's going to talk about um, the Japanese Earth Ob Observation Satellite Program. Uh, good morning. My name is Terry Nakajima. I'm going to talk about the Japanese situation about the Earth observations. 
this year we got a, a do you hear me? Oh. Hello. <laughs> My name is Terry Nakajima. I'm going to talk about the Earth observation situation in Japan. This year, uh, maybe three or four times, my wife asked me, what about pre recent uh, climate change? She never asked this one the last 30 years before. This is because the public, our public, getting more kind of uh, awareness, not awareness, rather fear about the disaster. The typhoon 19th this year, we got 88 uh, uh, dead person lost. In the last year, we had a heavy uh, rainfall situation in West Japan, which got uh, 200 people and uh, uh, died. Then the, uh, about the 4,000 people just evacuated, still living in, you know, living in such an uh, evacuation place. So this kind of situation all happened. So this figure gives you some huge typhoon 19th this year. Then the middle figure is the fence fell over to the houses. And the, the rightmost one is uh, our Shinkansen bread train in the flood. Japan used to be very strong, you know, infrastructure. We never expected this kind of things happening. So it's amazing things now happening. Having, so that's the linked to my wife's awareness about, or maybe fear about disaster. So sustainable development is our, you know, urging issue to do. Then why my wife sense like that is that because every day broadcasting give us information about us observation and also your, your cell phone. You can see uh, like a G, our uh, precipitation map, seeing where the, what kind of uh, precipitation coming or heavy, heavy storm coming on your cell phone. And this is one example that uh, um, this Eros high resolution uh, LIDAR gives you a, a huge in, in, uh, flooding areas in Japan. Also, uh, this is interesting, after the typhoon, this is Tokyo Bay, and this is coastline of Japan. But you see this murky area. This is uh, sand washed out from the land areas. You can see this one by our uh, 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 second generation global imager. And this is a simulation. You can see this one also on the cell phone. Uh, the river uh, network calculation giving you how much you know, uh, the water in the river in progress. Those things in all over networks, and I mean that the uh, cyber, cyber network to see. So this is the age for us now having, and uh, such a earth observation is very important now. Then we have uh, GCOM W, two meter and two and a half meters big and microwave antenna gives a very nice high-resolution resolu microwave imaging, and also the uh, uh, GPM, our uh, uh, precipitation core satellite, gives you light precipitation radar uh, uh, observations. Now, uh, we are, those are in the next phase. We have uh, 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 for the uh, follow-on missions for the GCOMW uh, microwave radiometers and also the follow-on mission studies for the uh, GPM follow on. And we have a bunch of uh, data for you to, uh, you, to, to be used, uh, to use uh, for the thing uh, I, I, today you got a lot of uh, the other uh, speaker talked about the uh, Antarctic and Arctic situation. So we have a nice uh, data set for those ones and also prep stations and also the land surface temperature, those information are gotten from this microwave measurement. And our uh, uh, data for the precipitation using uh, GPM satellite and uh, GCOM W satellite and also the, the microwave uh, infrared radiometers. And uh, JMA, Japan Metrology Agency, started the assimilation of those data sets. So this is without assimilation, this is 
a lot of rain anyhow, <laughs> but uh, this with uh, 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 precipitation radar assimilations and this ground observation, so becoming more, sim more uh, similar to the uh, ground observation, which used to be a very difficult task for the meteorological agency, such a sporadic uh, phenomena. But now such a uh, precipitation radar in space can do it. Now we have a long, come on. Long time operation of this uh, active sensor radar and uh, trim and GPM. So we try to get a better homogeneous data set by a long term calibration program. So we are very successful to get such a long term data uh, for the uh, solid uh, precipitation and precipitation and or even latent heat analysis. Then, of course, the emission, CO2, uh, we, uh, we have contributed using the GO satellite, and now 10 years anniversary, uh, this 2019th January, we have 10 years operation. So the satellite long-lived uh, lifetime is very important for us to have a sustainable observation. And now we're using that one to get the uh, like kind of a vertical information of the CO2 profiling using uh, short wave infrared uh, channels, also the infrared, thermal infrared channels. So this is a sort of unique function of a uh, GOS satellite uh, can provide you with. And uh, GOSA 2, we just launched this one the, next, uh, the last year, and we are uh, uh, progressing the good data set analysis for those. Now, CO measurement is possible with, with the CO, CO channel. So this is kind of a, a comparison with the uh, methane comparison with the, uh, I don't know, yeah, GOSA and GOSA 2 satellites. So getting, a good consistency and a good continuation of a satellite observation using uh, this uh, GOSAT and GOSAT 2 satellite. And now we are going to the third phase of a GOSAT mission, which is GOSAT 3, but we call this GOSAT Global Warming, <laughs> GW. So we carry a GOSAT satellite, get the CO2 measurement, also AMSAR 3, which gives you a microwave radiometer getting water vapor. So those two combined data set will be uh, provided with from such satellite. Now we are in a uh, 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 planning phase. And also we are going to have an NO2 measurement using the near uh, 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 ultraviolet regions to get this uh, NO2 data set. And uh, we have a bunch of nice uh, imagers, Himawari geostation satellite, 16 channels, and also GOSA C, second generation global imager, which gives you that uh, 25 channels with polarization visible, uh, uh, infrared and thermal. Even thermal, we have a 250 meters resolution, and also mount view angles. So we get the, a lot of information about using this second generation global imager, this global imager, where that's 250 meter resolution. And also the uh, uh, GOS satellite I just talked about. Then uh, this is uh, our product. Uh, cloud, aerosol, and the land, land surface information. And this kind of thing is SSD. So those are, are good data. Come on, this is difficult. So this is 250 meters uh, uh, second generation global images. So the uh, Potomac River areas, this river generating the clouds and joining, link, joining to this huge uh, mesoscale cloud system. We can identify this one. The, uh, this, this color, uh, uh, sky color is for the iced area of those one. And uh, this Californian areas showing the uh, smoke out plumes, and that is interacting with the cloud, getting the smaller particle radius of cloud droplet. So this cloud aerosol interaction, those things can be uh, observed from SGLI, 250 meters resolution. 
Also, interesting thing, important thing is that we do this one even for the SST measurement, 250 meters. So this is Japanese area. I've never seen such a fine structure of a SST uh, a plumes like this. So you can, you can use this one for the fishery and uh, those uh, even tourist information. And that uh, this one is the Typhoon 19's uh, uh, land shed out flew from the uh, land areas. And uh, you see some kind of an arc like this. I'm sorry, this is kind of a front of a, such a, uh, uh, like a wood come from the land area, just washed out. Then uh, this is uh, Sentinel's OCL, uh, OLCI and uh, our SGLS combination. Because we have a high resolution observation, like a one, one hour, next hour like this, then we can get difference to get such a nice, such arc of a front of such a debris coming over to the ocean. Then the, the ocean rescue team analyze this pattern to find the drowned people in the, the storm. They search this one, the movement, then the people just drown there, then they found it from this kind of image. Then Eros 3 and 4, now we are that second phase of Eros measurement. And next mission, R-Scare with a cloud profiling radar and the GOSAT I just talked about. Uh, uh, Himawari Jeme also have a second generation, uh, next generation, 11, 10 and 11. And those are coming into the database for the uh, elemental climate variables, which is very important for SDGs uh, data analysis. And our mission profile, now we are coming here to combine the GOSAT satellite with the uh, GCOM, uh, w, uh, GCOM uh, w AMSER uh, for our own missions like this. Then next mission, we are getting the uh, proposal from the 25 uh, science societies to get uh, next, what is, what is important. Then the LIDAR is also important, that, that's what they say. Also that the uh, precipitation and the cloud interaction, of course, aerosol interactions are also important. So my summary is that, is that uh, still I have time? I'm not sure. I'm okay, okay. So we have a ten, uh, ton, uh, tons of data from uh, many of our satellite data. And the next mission is ASCARE and uh, AL3 and 4. And the future mission is like, uh, uh, this is uh, GOSAT satellite and AMSER uh, microwave images. And the MORI is our LIDAR measurement uh, for biomass uh, biomass monitoring in the Himawaris. And uh, now we are gathering the uh, bottom-up recommendation for future ASMS missions. And inter collaboration, especially we are interested in the NASA's ACCP aerosol cloud convection precipitation uh, uh, initiatives, which is very interesting for us because we can contribute with the, our KUKA radar uh, later. And the COCGCM, like a, like a uh, elemental climate variables, and, and also the uh, global uh, greenhouse gas monitorings. Thank you very much. Thank you for this uh, uh, great and insightful presentation of all the great work that is done uh, in Japan. Um, in particular, looking at some of the greenhouse gases going forward, I think that's going to be fascinating. Um, my name is Peter Plotzer. Uh, I'm from a company called Spire Global. We use small satellites, a constellation of small satellites, to do Earth observation, in particularly for, for weather, climate, and extreme events. Um, we are now at the end of the, uh, of the presentations, and uh, we're now open for, for Q&A. And so I was hoping I could ask the esteemed panelists to, uh, to come on stage. Um, uh, and then I hope for an, an interactive session um, uh, uh, for, uh, for, for Q&A.
excellent. Uh, so with, uh, with, with all the speakers being so, so, so greatly on time, um, uh, I was hoping that the, that the audience will uh, uh, think about some questions. I see already a hand back there um, in the back. Um, sir, why don't you go ahead? So maybe we can uh, we can go down and talk about from the various agencies, you know, Joseph. Maybe you can uh, stop us off. No, thank you. I, I think your point is is really the one that uh, is giving us the biggest headache at the moment uh, because we have all these fantastic uh, pictures, simulations. You have seen them uh, before, and uh, we're doing we're investing a lot of money and time and energy to produce them. But uh, personally, I'm very frustrated that uh, I think there's so m we have s such treasures in our hands and we are not reaching the ones that are making decisions. That means the politicians, uh, the people in the government, in the ministries, but also the general public because they are stimulating or they are from bottom up creating the need for decisions to be made and the need for reaction. And uh, this is one of my, uh, personally, I, th I think one of my biggest uh, challenges I see that uh, we, are, we need to invest in, in, in this part. Uh, uh, you have seen probably from my presentation that we are investing in this. We are trying to address issues that are of relevance to people, uh, simulating their lives or the impact on their lives, uh, uh, whether this is on uh, sea level rise on, on, the, on the coastline or uh, food security in Africa or hazards or disasters or flooding uh, and how it, what it means for them personally uh, as individual citizens. But still, even if we have this information, we still need to bring it to the people and to the ones who are, who are uh, making decisions. And this is a bit also behind, and then I uh, hand over to my colleagues, but behind this vision I, I showed before on digital twin earth, because we would like to be able to react to some of the situations that are coming up. Uh, let's assume there are forest fires in, uh, I don't know, in the Amazon as we had them recently, or in uh, Siberia or in, in other parts in Europe. And we want to say, what does this really mean? Is it, uh, of course, there's pollution, of course, there's uh, uh, forest uh, being degraded and uh, disappearing and converted into other areas. But what does it mean for the people? What does it mean for the local people? What does it mean for the global people? And this is some, there I think we really need to create much more awareness and much more uh, yeah, access to, um, to people and uh, decision makers. So for the, um, for us, you know, I feel like you know sometimes you come to these conferences and you present uh, all of these slides and we're talking to ourselves and not really uh, you know going out there to, uh, and, and and touching and reaching the people that uh, that, that we must uh, uh, reach uh, with within NASA. We we have a lot of activities going on. Uh, we are reaching to some unusual partners, partnerships, if you will, with uh, some of the NGOs and um, uh, companies that uh, can take our data and use it for, for the betterment and benefit of, of others. Uh, uh, in, uh, speaking about Google before, uh, we um, uh, have a partnership with them where they take our data and actually um, uh, use it on, on Google Earth. And um, um, it's kind of uh, uh, ironic that uh, we can use our NASA logo 
in uh, a movie, but uh, we cannot use the NASA logo in, in the actual data that is used in, in Google. You know, so uh, we had to fight the lawyers about a uh, disclaimer that is actually in some of the, the, the pages that actually use uh, um, uh, NASA data. Uh, but that's the best that we can do. We cannot put, uh, you know, the, the saying that this is, uh, you know, space uh, science data. It, it is, uh, you know, kind of ironic. Uh, we also, um, uh, with uh, Conservation International, Mercy Corps, uh, we have uh, partnerships uh, trying to reach out, uh, you know, people in communities out there in, in other parts of the world. Uh, with Microsoft, we're working in uh, communities in the United States, uh, with community resilience, and try to understand uh, um, uh, issues uh, related to climate change and how uh, uh, our data can improve um, uh, cities. Um, and, and I have to say, um, you know, I have to say, my husband is in uh, community resilience, you know, and uh, he uh, works for DHS, and uh, so he, uh, it is. Uh, helping us uh, in many ways um, um, looking at and pushing the information uh, that we have for his work, which is uh, uh, very valuable in working with all the mayors of the, the United States and, uh, and utilizing satellite data to improve uh, um, the, the, the resilience of these communities. Um, we also working uh, with um, um, other federal agencies in uh, providing information and data that they need for their jobs, their work. Uh, and this is part of the, the GEO program. Uh, and, uh, you know, so we, we are really, uh, you know, with the SEVERE uh, program, we go in places, uh, you know, in the world where, the, you know, we, we can in, improve in, in, uh, the, the lives of many. Uh, the DEVELOP program is actually, you know, being a creative uses of our, our, our imagery. Uh, so um, uh, it is, a, uh, you know, it, it is a constant battle, and we have all these programs. But uh, I always feel that, that we're not doing enough, and we're not reaching far enough. And, uh, and, and that's part of the reason why I put, I put that slide in, in my package at the end, you know, that, uh, you know, we uh, can be ambassadors uh, ourselves and, uh, you know, reaching out to schools and uh, um, colleges and uh, our neighbors. And, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, it is just the, 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 the power of one uh, that multiplies, you know, and so, uh, you know, I, I just give you that challenge because, uh, you know, we, with all our communication power and with all of the information that we have, you know, we still uh, fall short in uh, providing that information to, to the communities. Thank you for the question. I think, um, and you rightly said it, uh, there's a lot of um, movement in the young generation in particular. And if you look at, for example, Fridays for Future as an example, I'm very interested in that because they talk about the future. They're basically saying uh, you are the society around them, let's say. Um, they're, they're more concerned about the next year's income, you know, the pension fund in the next two years. And in their narrative about society, they don't see their future discussed. They're upset about that. They say we're violating the intergenerational con tract uh, that we're supposed to be leaving a world behind or working with them on a bright future. When you work with Fighters of Future more closely, Joseph and I did it in the Living Planet Symposium earlier this year where we had Jakob Blasel be on stage with us. They are actually quite keen to work with scientists. There's a lot of trust in scientists in the Fridays for Future movement. Almost all other parts of society, they will not do joint activities, which, but they do that with scientists because they feel that scientists are giving them information numbers uh, to make the point. But they're also a little bit upset with us in the sense that they say, you are doing the diagnosis, you have a lot of insights, but where's the action? Where's the solution? Where's the picture for our world? the livable world for them. And I will say they have a point there. I think if you go at this AGU meeting and you ask yourself how many sessions are discussing the future of the next generation, my guess is there'll be less than 20. So there's something I think for us to think about uh, and that has all, not only to do with space science but in general with science. Maybe we don't make our science interestingly enough at times. Uh, maybe it's too tough, it's hard, too hard, the use of the science information. And maybe they don't see that as a scientist, you are part of the solution, the narrative about the future. So that's a communication issue. But I think in general, we have a wonderful opportunity because we have a lot of facts that they're interested in. 
We have technology that they're interested in. I like, Joseph, that twin Earth, that vision of the future. So I think we should work on that and make it a bit more of part of our communication strategy to be inviting open to all parts of society, including the next generation, and not just to the techie expert kind of world. So I think there's a real opportunity there, and I think we can do a whole lot. I uh, talked about my wife's case. So I think the uh, most of people and the students already fed with a lot of data, too much fed. So I don't like, you know, too much pushing and selling the data set. But if you watch our website, I can make account statistics. All the time, typhoon comes. The access rate is huge increase like this. So now we are in the way in the age of using data. For example, the Japan Meteorological Agency just uh, defined the warning level five, which tells you in the case of this your target area, you have to uh, take your movement to protect your life. So that, they need to look at the satellite data. Then actually they use that the phone, cell phone. So that kind of, you know, data use strategy is most important for us, the space agents, to do that. For that, I have, so I feel that the, uh, space, our space, Japanese space agency situation is too old fashioned. Because now processing data modeling so slow then we are start introducing the AI technology to increase the, the response time thousand times more to meet with such a, a requirement from the people. That's yeah, my comment. Yeah. Great. Do we have uh, uh, another question from the audience? Um, uh, maybe maybe I uh, I'll bring one to the panel. Why why the audience thinks um, it in all of the presentations the application size was actually mentioned. Um, but it wasn't really you know, um, uh, front and center. So one thing I wanted to ask the panelists is, how do you see the partnership potentially between the public sector and the private sector in taking some of that data and moving it into applications? Where, where could that handover be between the public and the private side? I don't know, maybe Martin, do you want to start at the end? Sure. Uh Another wonderful question, actually. Uh, and I think uh, in my summary slides, I mentioned partnerships. And I highlighted a bit the partnerships between the space folks and the, and the scientific community, but I could have just as much highlighted the partnership between the actor, let's say, from the public side of space to the private side of space as one example. Uh, but I think uh, the real opportunity for the private sector is to take that information that we learn from the sciences. I mean, this is more understanding principles, best practices, and so on, data sets and the like, but also in the more data provision real time. And then when you come to informing society, provide that knowledge to, to an actor that really needs it, say, on time and targeted, I think this is an opportunity for the private sector that can probably deliver that information in a tailored way much better than a government sector and certainly a scientific enterprise can. So I think, so what are the ingredients to make that a happy marriage? First of all, I think the data needs to be free and open. That's good for science, that's good for other users, I think that's clear. But I think second, it's about best practices, establishing good and best practice, uh, which are, uh, so if, if a private uh, data information provider can say, I'm sort of certified, whatever that means, I'm using a practice that uh, experts uh, of the community think is a, is a valid practice to process the data to provide that information, I think you gain more trust with the users. So I think the, the interface is there, the raw data, if you want to say, so the raw information at some level should be provided, I think, by the public sector. Uh, best practices should be established by academics, public sectors, and, 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 uh, and the actors themselves. But I think then delivering the data on time to a targeted audience is really something I think where the private sector is best suited and has a tremendous opportunity for a wonderful partnership. So from uh, our end, uh, I, I mentioned the, the I'm, I'm going to call it um, the unusual partnerships, uh, you know, because we, we are not, truly it is a partnership uh, with this uh, 
uh, NGOs and, and companies with Google, Microsoft, uh, Conservation International, and uh, Mercy Corps specifically. Uh, that um, you know, we, we don't have a contractual agreement or anything. It's a Space Act agreement for them to provide the best that they know how, and we provide to them the best that we know how. And together, we can do things that uh, you know we could not do alone. Uh, you know, so they they can take our data and and put it in the hands of of uh, the the people that they they reach out there. You know, so we started this um, uh, you know as an experiment and see how things uh, uh, would evolve. And uh, they have bear a, a, a lot of fruits. Uh, and uh, you know, we intend to expand uh, that those aspects um, as well. But uh, but I totally agree. I mean, the data has to continue to be um, uh, free and open. And uh, uh, you know, in many ways, we do have to help. Google, for example, understand our data and, uh, and and make good use of the data, but they know how to, you know, once they understand it, they know how to package it and, and, and put it in a story and, and put it out in, in Google Earth in a manner that uh, the people out there can, can, can understand it uh, better than, you know, sometimes we put things in so many high scientific um, uh, level uh, that uh, it's hard for some, uh, uh, for my, my mother who's 80 years old, you know, understand that, you know, so we need to sometimes, uh, you know, put things in a way that uh, anybody out there can understand uh, what, what, we, what we can do, what we provide, and the benefit that we add. I mean, what you, what you address, Peter, is a, is a very fundamental question, and uh, when I, became a director of Earth Observation some three years ago in ESA, uh, one of my first thoughts is, where do we stand? Are we still up to date? Are we too conservative? Do we need to, to look more into the private sector as a, as a source of uh, data, information, technology? Or is the, the way how we act and we work in ESA still the, the, the one that, uh, that needs to be done in, uh, uh, and is still up to date? So as you know, we, I went to Silicon Valley. Uh, that's where I met you. Um, to really get inspired of, of where is the interface of, um, of uh, the private sector and the public sector and how do they relate to each other. And uh, certainly we are living in a very dynamic uh, uh, time in Earth observation. Earth observation, I think, is the, one of the next frontiers where the commercial sector will certainly flourish and increase a lot. Uh, for example, in Europe, we have on the downstream sector uh, a growth of uh, about 12% per year, uh, which is one of the largest uh, growth domains in space. Uh, so saying that there's a, a lot of, of information needed, and uh, if there is a, a commercial interest, of course, commercial companies will come up and will provide some of this information. However, we're still far away from, I uh, would say, a very commercial sector. There's still a lot of, uh, I would say, uh, interaction and, uh, and transition. But, and having said that, uh, as you would know, I'm personally very, very keen in developing the commercial sector. I think this is the one that will thrive and will uh, flourish or uh, bring, uh, bring much of the information we need because simply they are very fast, uh, very agile, very responding to market needs and I think doing uh, a lot what is required. But I'm also firmly convinced, um, and I'm not saying this because I'm ESA, I'm firmly convinced that you do need the public sector, and you do, you do need the public sector a lot in order to have the private sector develop and flourish. And I just recently read a, a very interesting article from an economist uh, called Mariana Matsukato. Uh, some of you may, may know, uh, she's a professor looking into the, into the uh, relation between private, public, or what is the role of state in order to develop the commercial sector. And one interesting uh, finding or uh, result of her research was, uh, take the example of uh, what you have every day in your hands, every minute in your hands, the iPhone. Uh, how much do you think, how much money uh, of the iPhone has been coming through public investments? Almost everything, from the display to the chips to the, uh, the various software elements. Uh, so many of these elements uh, have been funded through uh, public uh, money, uh, one way or another. Uh, Steve Jobs had the, was the genius putting it all together and making it a, a very commercial product, one of the best-selling products in the world today. Uh, but this applies to many other things as well. The same applies in the space domain, the SpaceX. Uh, SpaceX uh, plus uh, Tesla all together have got billions, as you know, investment from the public. But they are very thriving commercial companies. So this interaction of uh, private and public has to work, but I think the private, uh, uh, the, sorry, the commercial 
uh, institutions or governments, uh, they have to come with very with good ideas, very bold ideas, uh, allowing private industry to develop on top of it. Uh, Matsukato calls it action-oriented, uh, mission-oriented uh, investments, where you have a mission. Uh, the best known example is the Apollo mission, where you have a mission, you invest government money in order to, to go somewhere or do something, and then the private sector really can thrive on it. And I think this is a very good model, and I'm convinced that this also describes well the interaction of private with the uh, public sector. Uh, that question is a uh, big pain for the Japanese space agency because government always uh, you have to earn the money. You have to get the money from the, uh, the uh, private sector for launching the satellite. But I, 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 I should say that the Earth observation satellite, you cannot earn the money because this is kind of, uh, you know, our infrastructures in that sense. Uh, uh, EU's aquaponics is a good idea, you know. The satellite, uh, the public launch the satellite and uh, provide the data to the private sector to be used. So I think that should be taken in Japanese situation also. And the usefulness is everything. Then I, I myself is the director of the uh, uh, satellite data company, uh, NPO though, uh, to sell the satellite data to the uh, private uh, companies, mostly for the solar generation. My algorithm is very fast and uh, we're selling those data. So all the people, in related people, should invent such a uh, way of using those data set to combine. So then the pu pu public sector should, um, how to say, um, put the effort for having a nice infra uh, structure for the uh, private sector to use. So this kind of interaction is very important. Thank you. Um, do we have a question from the audience? Oh, excellent, please. I think you either have to come forward or speak up a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Martin, did you get that? Yeah, I think I did. So, wonderful question. Thank you very much. So, the question was about um, uh, the dialogue with Africa. So, so first, uh, um, you ask uh, very much sort of how are we involved in, in with our, working with our colleagues in Africa. I, I really think the first thing we, we do, what I do, I, I go to Africa quite a bit. I sit down with people there and ask questions, you know, do you use space information? Do you have ambition to use more of that? Where do you get the data from? You know, what are your questions? You know, how do you process uh, that information and, and where you need? And I think if you sit down uh, with, with the colleagues in, in the various countries, you get different answers in different regions. Africa is a huge place, obviously. But I think there are certain patterns emerging in that dialogue which are interesting. First, uh, they're very much aware of what, what happens in our countries. Uh, they understand that. They wish they could have uh, uh, a an, an, an satellite uh, economy. Uh, they could have their own satellites, their own space programs in, in their region. And there's some good uh, motions in that direction. Uh, but I also find that there are, they feel that there's a lot of information out there that sort of sort of know that, but they are, they're not so sure how they can access that. They don't. They're not so sure exactly how much there is. And there's two experiences I found on the ground by talking to the colleagues, uh, which I want to report here. One is, it's too expensive. And I asked them, 
What do you mean by that? Why is it so expensive? They said, well, I talked to somebody you know, a few weeks ago, and they said if I, if I want that information on a particular region, in this case was an ocean region, I'm on something in our ocean environment, it's going to cost me 5,000 euros a month to get that information on a daily basis or on a weekly basis, and I don't have the money. And I said, well, but they're using the Copernicus data, which is free, available, so why is it so expensive? And then you find out that they talked to a consultant from the Global North who made an offer to that particular colleague uh, to extract the data for the region that they wanted, and that's what he or she charges. It's a very normal business proposition. But from an African perspective, then I said, well, how about if you set up a little training group in your area, you learn how to use the data yourself, you work with your colleagues who are computer literate, and you, and you do it like that. And I think, oh, can I do that? And I said, yeah, sure you can. So I, f I feel that the dialogue starts right there. It's, it's understanding how the system works, how access can be facilitated. And, and, and I feel what, we're, what we should be doing is really thinking, is teaching our colleagues around the globe, not just in Africa, second, next generation, other colleagues, how to get access to the data. And, and how to use them and, and how to work with the private company for some services, with the academic community for other services, that's a good way into it. And then you, from that you can build on other capacities which eventually might lead to a small CubeSat program or something bigger in space. But, but quite often that gradient of knowledge is so huge and the assumptions that some things that you might have to have are often not exactly true, uh, that I feel there's a lot of impediment there. So, so my, my point is I'm not going to think about a strategy for Africa. If I think about one, what is well, it's one of dialogue, sitting down with the colleagues, working with them, and see where they are, where they want to go, and find out what good solutions could look like. I just wanted to uh, uh, add that, uh, you know, with NASA, and I know the question wasn't for me, but that's okay. Uh, the, um, uh, we have uh, capacity uh, building in, in, you know, a lot of regions of the world, uh, you know, our severe program and uh, our set uh, trainings uh, provides um, a lot of support for um, communities to learn how to use uh, the data that, that we have. And, um, you know, it, it is uh, um, is there for the, for the, you know, for the asking and, uh, uh, just, uh, you know, let us know. It sounds like uh, some people are trying to monetize um, the, the, the data access and, um, you know, and, and we need to find a way to actually get the data free and open the way it is in the hands of people who need it out there and teach them how to use it, so. Um, it was actually uh, uh, interesting to me that uh, Africa was mentioned twice in the presentations in particular, Martin's in your presentation talking about the growth from, from Asia and from Africa and how that is going to dominate um, the next century. But when I look at the esteemed panel, it is dominated by regions that are the flat curves on your graph. Um, uh, any, in, any thoughts from someone like why, why do we not have more engagement from um, you know, the, the growing part of the world, be that you know, in Asia and, or, or Africa or Latin America even? Well, let me uh, take that question. I think uh, we do have engagement, so I don't think we should take this panel to be representative of the whole community. I think that wouldn't be fair, right? But it is true that having assets in space is a costly proposition. It takes a lot of investment, it takes a lot of knowledge, technology, engineering, experience. You know, my esteemed colleagues come from organizations which have 20 plus years history of doing that. And those who are coming newer to the game, look at China, look at India, they're catching up quickly, but they have a learning curve to go through. You can look at other countries like Israel and so on. So there's more and more actors coming into space, but they're also fully realizing to be competitive with those who've been in there for, for, for two, two decades, it's not so easy, right? So, so that's, that's a technical challenge. But, but I think we all discussed about, you know, the hardware in space is one element of it, but it's the science around space, which is more about use, it's more about fusion, it's more about asking the right questions, uh, combining the data sets. So that is a much richer activity. And I think if you look at that community, uh, which I work with, I, I find you, you'll find it much more diverse than this particular panel here. Please, please, Mr. Um, as for uh, Asia, a lot of interest about and uh, use using satellite data. Then uh, we just finished that uh, uh, Asia Pacific Regional Space Agency Forum, we call that APRSAF, 
in Japan. Then a lot of Asian people come discuss about how to use it, and and like a, like a forest management, we call that JJ first by the Japanese government aid. We call the JICA, and also sub. Uh, typhoon uh, situations, monitoring using Himari data, so that the Asian country are very eager to use it, and uh, they start having their good uh, initiative in own countries, and the right. collaboration, of course. Right. Joseph. No, just uh, very briefly, I, I think the the most uh, interesting part of, of space is the use of the data, um, and uh, there um, I really would hope and I see a lot of opportunities in Africa. Um, I mentioned uh, uh, EU Africa on our side. Uh, we also have another project where we will work with the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank uh, again in making sure that these data are being used for the projects in the region. And we need engaged people. Uh, I would be, and I'm very happy you, you raise your hand and, uh, and, and say, you know, what can it do for myself? What can it do for Africa? And how can we build up partnerships? And uh, uh, this is one of the challenges we also face sometimes, I, I, I would like to build this up. Uh, we are both, uh, or all three of us, or all four of us, uh, up, sitting up here are very interested to engage and uh, I think to build up uh, projects, activities on how this can work together. But I think one secret uh, in, in order to help uh, uh, in Africa, but not only in Africa, is to make sure that our d data remain free and open. It was said before, but this is the key ingredient to success of using this data for society. And I think this is something we are pushing, certainly on our side and uh, also by our colleagues. The, the, uh, I wanted to, you know, um, also bring up in, in Latin America, because I've been traveling quite a bit, and uh, there is a, um, now with the advent of the CubeSats, you know, I mean, everybody wants to have their own CubeSats. And, uh, you know, so you got uh, Costa Rica, I was born in Costa Rica, they launched a CubeSat uh, um, about a year and a half ago have their own, they're calling their data. Uh, and um, uh, Paraguay, they want to do the same thing. Uh, of course, uh, you know, Mexico did uh, the same, you know, so you have all of these, uh, you know, um, small projects that they have in their hands and they are, uh, you know, uh, trying to figure out how to, how, how to be a, a, um, a little child walk, you know, crawling into the space program, if you will. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it takes, uh, you know, a little bit of effort. These countries, you know, um, you know the, the, the comments that I always get and this, the, the money part, you know, it is expensive to, to do this work. It is expensive to put something in orbit. It is, a, it, you know, and, and um, a lot of the, the feelings in a lot of these countries is that we're taking money from uh, other, um, you know, social aspects uh, to do something that may or may not add value in, in the end, you know. So uh, what I try to do when I when I talk to uh, them is like you know but you know there is a lot of data and it's global data and you don't have to collect your own data in order for you to uh, you know um, you know do something in a space uh, we need a lot of people across the world to take the data understand it analyze it and uh, you know for the benefit of, uh, of everyone you know so uh, uh, and we, we um, uh, recently, uh, about a year ago, also signed a, a contract with the uh, system of system integration uh, in Central America. You know, so all these Latin Central American countries, you know, are uh, starting to use um, uh, the free and open data that we, you know, offer uh, for the benefit of the Central Central America. You know, they don't have to launch their own satellite, but they can uh, make uh, free use of of all of the resources that that, that we have. And you know, so. Uh, uh, it is also changing the, the paradigm, you know, in, 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 in the way you talk to them. You know, they, they all want to be space agencies, but they can't, you know. So how can they contribute in the way that they can with the money that they have and with the people that they have, you know. So it is, uh, you know. Maybe one small point. I think it's, so we, 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 I think it's clear on the provider side, but it's on the use side that we should be very interested in. And I think what I also finding is that our cultures have a certain way we are trained, you know, we are very fact-based, we like big data sets. That's kind of something we've learned in school already or maybe at late, later at university. When you go to a more community-based society like Africa and Latin America and so on, it's a little bit different. So, so you, you, you get your information out of the community. There's a lot of uh, indigenous knowledge, local knowledge, practical knowledge that's out there. And I think what I find exciting is if you can fuse that type of knowledge with the remote sense type of knowledge, 
and really get into this fusion area, then you, we have a much better reach. And there's some very good examples that I know from Africa, which are cell phone based, uh, SMS based, uh, sort of warning systems on the one hand, but also crop issues where, where, where smart people use the space information, which is scary and technical for the community, but fuse it with the local knowledge with the, and, and, and add value to that. So, so you don't have to switch like 100% to go from your local knowledge based society to a technocratic society like ours are, but you make that, that move more integrative, more onerous, and that's what I meant by that knowledge base, where you have to serve up also the local data, the local knowledge, just and, and fuse together with some of the exciting remote sensing or other more technical information that we have. I think and it's that fusion where I think you open many more doors rather than telling you, forget your local knowledge, here's better knowledge, comes from me, you pay the fee, it'll be wonderful. That, that narrative does not work. I think, uh, uh, I hope everyone agrees with me that this has been an, an incredibly inspirational um, uh, session. I mean, on one hand, we saw like the warning from uh, uh, our, our Japanese uh, colleague's wife and like the feeling <laughs> of like, um, uh, you know, things are all really, really bad. I think on the other hand, we saw some of the tremendous programs and partnerships um, an increase of 29% uh, for, for the Copernicus program. So I think you're really a leaning into um, uh, uh, the data provision side, but also as, as has been mentioned before and from our uh, colleague from New Zealand, an uprising in like the, the grassroots interest in, in doing change, in tackling something which affects all of us uh, in, a, in a tremendous way. So please join me in, in thanking our panel for sharing their views today. <laughs>